I again. Walter Davis, part three in We Left Jehovah's Witnesses. I have a recollection of another occasion when I was personally disciplined for getting out of line. My sin was delivering a talk on the Lord's Prayer at an area book study. I had used a previous Watchtower article setting forth the Society's views on Matthew chapters 5 to 7. I had tried to vary my topics when speaking at the area studies because we all had heard the same public lectures many times over at the, at the hall. I recall hearing frequent complaints, especially from new brethren, about how boring the same talks became after hearing them several times. What I had done was really not a violation of society instructions. Our servants wanted us to give the same public talks at the smaller area study meetings. Because a number of people commented favorably on my speaking on various themes, some of the other speakers became jealous and complained to the local overseer. He called me in and warned me to follow his instructions. Only subjects of public lectures delivered in the Kingdom Hall were to be used at the local area talks once a month. Thereafter, I theocratically rehashed a public lecture at the area study speaking assignment. I had held our congregation servant in high esteem when I first joined the witnesses, but I was to learn that he had many weaknesses, among them a great fondness for strong drink. Many Jehovah's Witnesses manifested a strong appetite for alcoholic beverages. This always bothered me because I had been taught total abstinence by my parents, who, by the way, were Southern Baptists when he was born, and by my RLDS, that is Mormon teachers. Drink was certainly a problem for my overseer, who worked for the railroad. After I had left the Jehovah's Witnesses, a Christian employee on the railroad told me that he had once seen him so drunk on the job that he couldn't work. The problems he and his wife had with his mother were common knowledge among the congregation publishers. His wife made his mother move out of the house, and she was taken in by another witness family. He and his stepdaughter also had strained relations. The ministry school servant was a cold, aloof, yet domineering individual who alienated many brethren by his overly critical remarks and attitude. A couple that he and his wife had studied with and had brought into the truth left the organization after only six months. I called on this couple myself to try to win them back after the overseer had failed to do so. They said that it had become obvious to them that they were be befriended as an inducement to get them to join the organization. Others in the local hall had also been very cordial toward them until they were baptized. Then the situation changed. They were then told to think theocratically and not independently. The ministry school servant and his wife ceased to socialize with them and became distant. They said this experience had opened their eyes to the real motives of these witness friends, and they felt that Jehovah's Witness servants were interested in new publishers only to the extent that they advanced theocratic interests. This couple left the congregation, and I later heard that they had joined a Russellite sect. It was obvious to me that our, our congregation servant retained his position because of his theocratic obedience rather than because of his Christian character. Shortly before I became a Jehovah's Witness in 1954, the San Bernardino congregation had been divided into two units. I was associated with the East Unit, which had a majority of white publishers, while the West Unit had a preponderance of black and Mexican witnesses. The society had boasted much of the love and unity among Jehovah's Witnesses, and this claim, which I believe to be true, had helped draw me to it. I was to learn, in reality, that with many Jehovah's Witnesses this was not the case. The East Unit overseer would frequently refer to the West Unit as that Congo or Ubangi congregation, and would state contemptu contemptu contemptuously that he didn't want any of those ignorant blacks, this is his phrase, ignorant blacks delivering lectures in our congregation. I once overheard a white brother remark about a black brother who was an accomplished speaker. He may be an, and he uses the n-word, he may be an, but he can sure talk. Mexicans who conversed in Spanish together in the presence of whites were eyed with suspicion and were disliked by some white witnesses. After a few years of association with the so-called New World Society, I came to the realization that many people who were in it 
were really little different from those in the world. I had to admit to myself, I couldn't have admitted it to other Jehovah's Witnesses, that we were really no better or worse in our attitude, character, and life than any other group of religious people. The Society was continually exhorting us in the pages of the Watchtower and at assemblies to produce the fruit of the Spirit, as found in Galatians 5, 23 Yet the emphasis was on organizational thinking. Such thinking, we were told, would produce this fruit. We were not to be concerned with independently producing a Christian character, for this was viewed as selfish, dangerous, untheocratic thinking, which could put us out of step with the victorious march of the society into the new world. I look back now and realize how this theocratic thinking often produced unhappy, miserable people. I recall a large German family of witnesses whose father had died. The mother and her children were very active in the field ministry. Mrs. Kramer was the one who first studied with my mother, and it was with her older children that I first debated Mormon doctrine. An older son and two older daughters were local pioneers. Her son, Don, a pioneer, once told me that his mother had caught him studying the old society books written by Pastor Russell. Don said he had been comparing the differences between what Russell taught and what the society then taught. This upset his mother so much that she took the books and burned them. This family was so maligned and ill-treated by the other witnesses that the oldest son hated Jehovah's Witnesses and the youngest son suffered a nervous and emotional breakdown. Several years after my mother and I left the society, she met Mrs. Kramer once on a downtown street. This poor old lady poured out her woes to my mother and concluded by saying, we have been treated terribly by that bunch down at the hall, but they will be judged at Armageddon. But they have the truth, Mrs. Davis, so come on back into the organization mother witnessed to her about faith in christ as the truth i recall a meeting i recall meeting a, a jewish witness at a convention who pioneered with his wife in talking to him about his discovering the truth i recall vividly something he said to me he stated that he had been a baptized jehovah's witness for a year and a half before he really really believed in christ jesus as the messiah hearing this caused me to remember my dad's testimony of the necessity of being born again by accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. Jesus had been little more to this witness than a name in Watchtower Publications. He said the name Jehovah meant more to him than the name Jesus Christ. This Jewish fellow and his Gentile wife were later sent to Israel as Watchtower missionaries. Most Jehovah's Witnesses referred to Jesus Christ as the Savior, but rarely as my Savior. After meeting the Society's requirements for pioneering, I bought a car and began to pioneer in my home congregation on November 1, 1956. I can honestly state that I did enjoy my pioneer experience as a Jehovah's Witness and do have some fond memories of it. My sorrow and regret is that I was not really preaching the truth, Jesus Christ, and bringing people into a saving relationship with Him. I witnessed on the streets and from house to house made back calls on literature placements, conducted book studies with people of goodwill, and delivered public lectures. By society standards, I was a good Jehovah's Witness pioneer. Next time, uh, Walter begins to have serious doubts. I'll put in a link to a series we did, I think eight videos which are interlinked. The first one is how finished is the mystery? Now this deals with the Watchtower's treatment of the book of Revelation in that famous book, which is still famous among witnesses, although none of them seem to have read it. How finished is the mystery? Eight videos altogether, and, and uh, we'll show you the, the passages from that book that had the power to even shake Vivian's faith. When she was still a loyal witness going to the Kingdom Hall, it was reading certain passages from the finished mystery that first alerted to the, the fact that there's something seriously wrong with this organization that could brag about such a book and its impact. Yes, reading the old publications indeed will break the spell of the Watchtower, so no wonder they seem to be back into, well, if not book burning, getting rid of all older literature, not just Russell's, not just Rutherford's 
literature going back just a decade or, or two is now being eliminated from circulation, at least the physical copies. And from what we hear, the the available versions on JW Org are also being changed. So I'm not surprised because that's been the tendency ever since Russell was alive back in 1915. He was already changing his original publications without crediting. So we'll see you next time for more of Walter Davis and his eventual departure from the Watchtower.